Mandela. So my job today is to bring us to where the United States and probably the rest of the country, Europe, Britain, is at in addressing DNR status. Okay? And some of the pitfalls in the interpretation and not using common language and causing confusion amongst physicians and nurses and even respiratory therapists is actually going to harm patients. Okay, so this is really all about meeting the patient's wishes in a scientific way and reviewing what is happening in the rest of the country. It would not be a good idea for us to create our own set of language definitions when the rest of the country is already addressing this via not just individual hospitals but professional societies and the American Heart Association, Society of Critical Care Medicine, etc. So first of all, I'm going to review some of the new 2015 ACLS guidelines. There is a movement called Get With the Guidelines by the American Heart Association. There's about 50 or 100 parameters that we're supposed to look at to look at quality of outcomes for code blues. Okay, this is again limited strictly to CPR. Okay, so let's define what CPR is, what is no CPR, what is DNR, what is do not intubate, etc. We also have to look at the effectiveness of hospital CPR. How many of you think that we're better at having survival rates in the hospital versus out of hospital? What are you more likely to survive, in a hospital or out of hospital, if you were to have a cardiac arrest? It's bad either way. It's bad either way, but your chances are better at home. And you know, yeah, your survival rates are much higher in out of hospital cardiac arrest. Why is that? Because the patients in the hospital are sicker. Yeah. Right? It's not that we are, that paramedics are better than us. They may be, so they're very good, all right? But the point that we're trying to make here is that you're in the hospital for a reason. You're at home for a reason. You're at home because you're doing well. And sudden cardiac death at home generally occurs in otherwise healthy people. Cardiac arrest in hospital does not happen in otherwise healthy people. They're in the ICU. So they're not likely to survive, right? So that's a very important point. The other thing that I want to go over is this go far score. Okay, go far score means good outcomes for attempted resuscitation. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, not many physicians have. This go far score came out in 2013. Okay, it's the biggest study ever done looking at outcomes from CPR in the hospital. Yet, I don't find any physicians know about this. Even intensivists don't know about this. This was a landmark <coughs> study, and I'm going to go over that. So really what the GOFAR score tells us is who are good candidates to do ACLS or CPR in the hospital. And if we know from the GOFAR score that your survivability with good neurological outcome is very poor, I think we have an obligation to tell our families. No matter how uncomfortable that conversation is, and often it is uncomfortable, and families often leave us like, you know, really emotionally distraught and distressed, I don't think we can dance around the truth. Because, you know, it is uncomfortable for everybody. But I think we have to sit down with our team and say, look, this is what's going to happen to mom and dad. Okay? It's your choice, it's your decision, patient autonomy still rules, but these are the facts. And that they do want to know. I mean, most of the families, they tell me, well, Dr. Ravi, I'm really upset, but thank you so much. No other physician has talked to us the way you have. I get that all the time. All right? So, and so the decision making is really up to us. It's shared decision making. We make decisions with the family, with the ICU team, the doctors, the nurses, the RTs, the social workers. We all have to be on the same page. If we're not, then the clarification of the patient goal becomes a mass ball of confusion. So that's my goal here, okay? If I can just get that today, I will be so happy, <laughs> all right? So here's a typical case that we have in the ICU, in any ICU, anywhere in the country. I'm just taking one scenario, okay? It's a 74-year-old female. She has COPD. She had a stroke in the last couple of weeks. She goes to the nursing home. She aspirates. She comes to the emergency room with pneumonia. She's in septic shock. She's desaturating. She cannot communicate. There is no advanced directive available. The ER doctor immediately intubates her correctly. Okay, he doesn't know what's going on. The, the family's not there. The paramedics don't have the advanced directive. All right. In the ER, her lactic acid level is five millimoles. She gets three liters of fluid. She started on norepinephrine. Gets a central line. Gets the antibiotics. We meet the sepsis bundle. All right. 
which is a CMS core measure. Patient gets admitted to the intensive care unit, the central line is inserted, the patient remains hypotensive on maximum amount of norepinephrine. The lactic acid continues to stay about the same, which is not making much urine output. What should we do? Very common scenario, right? See this every day, every day in any ICU. So next morning the family comes in, we, uh, social worker contacts the two daughters that come in, we find that she has an advanced directive. Okay, the advanced directive is found, and the advanced directive says that she would not want any heroic or aggressive measures if she were to be in a compromised neurological condition. They often call it vegetative state, right? That's a very common statement in advanced directives that we find. So now we're stuck here. We're stuck in limbo. We've resuscitated this patient. We're in for a penny. We're going to be in for a pound. Correct? What do we do? So the family asked me, well, Dr. Habib, so I addressed the code status with her. So she has an advanced direct. She probably wouldn't have wanted all of this. We don't know. We don't know what the outcome is going to be neurologically. But they say to me, well, you know, if we were to do CPR, I asked them about CPR and say, if we were to do CPR, Dr. Habib, what is our outcome going to be? Because she does not want to be a vegetable according to the advanced directive. Well, give me the statistics, okay? So that's a frequent question, right? So then we have to say, what well, do we know? Do we know that this lady is going to have neurological survival or not? Or is she going to be gorked out in a nursing home, which she doesn't want, okay? So what is the likelihood of normal independent CNS function after CPR? That's what they want to ask me. That's what they want to know. Okay, and what should we say? Okay, her advanced directive only states that she would not want to be left in a vegetative state, right? And she's never been intubated before. All right. So, what do you think that the survival rate of this patient after CPR in functional neurological performance will be? A, cannot tell, 30 to 50 percent, 15 to 30 percent, 10 percent, or less than 1 percent. B, 10%. 10%. 10 percent. 10 percent. 10 or E. Less than 1 percent. So I hope thinks that there's a less than 1 percent chance that this lady will meet the goal that she desired per her advanced directive. Okay? All right, let's keep that. Okay, I'm not going to give you the answer right now. We're going to hold you in suspense. All right? <laughs> Following the family meeting, Dr. Habib, after discussing with the family, enters a no CPR order in the chart. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean to the rest of the staff? Dr. Habib leaves, okay, and at night time, what are the nurses going to do? What does that really mean? And do we have a universal definition <coughs> of how to take care of this patient? All right, so I'm going to go back to go with the ACLS guidelines. It's called, okay, it's called get with the guidelines. So let's first of all review what CPR means, okay, and what do we do when we initiate CPR? So CPR basically is only initiated when the patient is dead. Okay, let's make that clear definition. All right, CPR only applies when the patient is clinically dead. Dead. How do we define that? We define that when the patient is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. Right? And every nurse and doctor knows that, and we teach lay people that too. When that happens, fortunately in the ICU, we know what the rhythm is. There can only be three rhythms. It's asystole, flat line, PEA, electrical mechanical dissociation, or VTAC or VFIT, all right? At that point, what you're going to do as a nurse or layperson outside, but in the hospital, we're going to do beyond basic CPR. We're going to start chest compression immediately. You're going to get the crash cart into the room. You're going to open it up. You're going to see what the rhythm is, all right, and assess the rhythm. And you've got to make sure that you do effective chest compression at least for a couple of minutes. The earliest you can deliver a, a shock in the hospital is three to five minutes nationally. Okay, in an airport or in a casino, patients can get an electrical shock through an AED within two minutes. So we're much slower, okay, because we don't have AEDs, all right? So the point of effective chest compression is to start circulation immediately. Without chest compression, the other drugs and the shock is not going to work, right? And then after you give a drug or a shock, you have to do effective chest compressions for at least two more minutes, even if they have return of spontaneous circulation. 
So the point being is that chest compressions by themselves are not going to make this patient survive. Neither is each individual drug or shock. Okay, therein lies the flaw of thinking of partial codes or recommending to family chemical codes or electrical codes is scientifically unacceptable. It is ineffective and we shouldn't be recommending it. And we shouldn't even let it enter our brain. Because if we let that poison enter our brain, we're causing more confusion. CPR is a bundle. It's an all or none effect. You wouldn't do a sepsis bundle and leave out antibiotics, right? Mm -hmm. Or vasopressors. So just think of CPR in the same way as you think of a sepsis bundle. I'd be crazy to tell a patient, well, we're not going to give you fluids or vasopressors, but I'm going to give you antibiotics and hope for the best. Okay, that would be insane. Similar fashion, recommending partial codes, and I'll get back to that, okay? So, the other thing that we want to make sure is that when you initiate CPR, we have technology now to see if the patient's heart is going to pump effectively during chest compression and after the patient comes back. And that's measured by capnography and tidal CO2 monitor. Okay, so if the tidal CO2 is less than 10 during CPR, several things are going on. Either your rescuer is tired, you're doing ineffective chest compression, you don't have a good airway or a seal, and the last possible medical diagnosis is the patient could have a massive PE. So always think of that as a differential. So we're also working on this, getting end tidal CO2 during all codes. What happens when the patient's heart comes back, starts pumping, the end tidal CO2, which is the CO2 in the breath, abruptly increases to over 30. Unless that happens, you continue CPR. Okay, if the end tidal <coughs> CO2 is less than 10, you resume CPR. All right? Some of this is technical stuff, all right? And the main thing that they're recommending is do not do pulse checks, all right? Now, here's the thing in terms of survivability. End tidal CO2 is very important because when you're monitoring end tidal CO2 during a code, if your end tidal CO2 remains less than 10 for 20 minutes, you terminate the CPR, okay? Because the survivability drops even lower than the statistics I'm going to give you. So doing CPR beyond 20 minutes should really have some extraneous circumstance. Patient is hypothermic, they're 20 years old, they were drowning, they're cold. You gotta give me something, all right? This lady who's 70 years old with a stroke, if she codes, we're not gonna do CPR beyond 20 minutes if her end title doesn't come back. The end title is so, so important, okay? Here's the survivability, okay? If the patient's end tidal CO2 is over 30, their pulse is back. However, if the end tidal CO2 remains less than 20, okay, you should terminate CPR because the prognosis is very poor. So that's the other thing it helps us. Now, there's some changes in the new ACLS guidelines. Epinephrine, one milligram every three to five minutes is still in. Again, remember, you have to circulate after a drug or a shock. You cannot give a drug or a shock and not circulate. It's ineffective, all right? The other thing is that vasopressin is out. No more vasopressin. It's not any more effective than epinephrine. We need to take it out of our crash cart. A lot of doctors still use vasopressin. It's ineffective. Amiodarone is still in. Magnesium for torsad is in. But guess what? Lidocaine is back in. Mm -hmm. All right? Remember many years ago, we used to use lidocaine for persistent VTAC and VFib, so if the patient does not respond to amiodarone and has refractory VTAC, VFib, we need to get lidocaine back in the crash cart. At Lodi, where I work, it's very hard for me to get lidocaine back in the crash cart. Pharmacy refuses. They say, we don't have it. So we need to ask pharmacies if we can get lidocaine back in our crash cart. Post-arrest targeted temperature for VTAC, VFib is either 33 to 36. It used to be 33. Most people are now doing 36 because the outcomes are exactly the same and it's less nursing, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, stuff for nursing to do. Guess what? For every code blue that we resusc resuscitate and revive, the average cost is $200,000. Okay? And if you do cooling, that cost can go up to even higher because once you cool a patient, you cannot prognosticate for at least five days. That's the recommendation. These are new recommendations, okay? Once you cool somebody with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest or in-hospital VTAC, VFib, and you start targeted cooling, you have to wait at least five days to prognosticate because a lot of them wake up much later. All right, so you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, all right? 
So that is why addressing code status is very important. Okay, remember, ethically, legally, out of all the things that we do in medicine, CPR is the only medical intervention that you must do without consent. If I want a pick line, if I want a central line, if I want to intubate, if I want to dots, I have to get your consent. CPR is the only intervention in hospitals that I have to do. And to not do it, I need consent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's kind of odd, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we are in a bind. That means I cannot say, you're not going to get CPR, sir, madam. Okay. So CPR is only initiated when the patient has a cardiopulmonary arrest. Okay. And that's defined by, like I said, apnea, pulseless, unresponsive, and you have those cardiac rhythms. It is an all or none phenomenon. It's a bundle. Don't break it up. All right. This is where the confusion happens that we're going to do a chemical code and we're going to do an electrical. Please, let's get rid of that in our scientific brains. We're nurses, we're doctors that take care of critically ill patients. It is, you know, non-scientific and you're harming patient. All right. So cardiac arrest, as I said, is defined by these three rhythms. Which rhythm is the most common? How often do you find a shockable rhythm if you were to go to code blues in the hospital? Only 20%, yeah. 17 to 20%. All right, 80% of the patients when we go to code blues have asystole or PEA, which has a worse prognosis. Okay, the survivability with CPR with asystole, and when you see asystole and PEA, it's pretty bad. Okay, so the point of ACRS is to establish perfusion. You start chest compression, right? And then you look at cardiac rhythm, establish cardiac contractility, but you have to continue maintaining perfusion, which may require fluids, more chest compressions, vasopressors, etc. All right, which is all part of the ACLS. So guess what? There's a CPR registry in this country, right? And there followed thousands and thousands of patients, 500,000 patients, about 300,000 patients code in the hospital in this country. 250,000 patients code outside the hospital. So you're looking at half a million patients every year have cardiac arrest either in hospital or out, out of hospital. So we do have a lot of data. One thing I want to clarify is that when a daughter orders a no CPR or a DNR order or a no code, they're exactly the same. Okay, no C CPR is the intervention. The order could be to the nurse, do not resuscitate. That's the order I can write in the chart, or I can just write in the chart, no CPR. It's the same meaning. Basically, it tells the staff that in the event of a cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we will not implement any of the components of ACLS. Black and white. Let's not confuse that, because therein we are messing things up. If we don't come to the same conclusion that the rest of the country and the rest of the world is talking about, when you read the literature as a nurse or a doctor, you're going to be completely confounded. Because the literature, when you pick up a critical care journal or a resuscitation journal, this is the definition. All right? So we got to get in with the rest of the country. All right? That's what a no D or DNR or DNAR, some people call it DNAR, do not attempt resuscitation. Same thing, okay? The bottom line is that when they're dead, we're going to allow a natural death. We're going to allow God to take that person. We will not intervene as scientists. All right? For that to happen, you need consent. Who should give you that consent? The patient themselves, by an advanced directive, and if they cannot speak, hopefully a surrogate, who is their family member, can give you that consent, right? We have a patient upstairs that we admitted yesterday who doesn't have decision-making capacity because it's developmentally delayed. There is no family, there's no brother, there's no mother, there's no sister. So then we have to ask a conservator, okay? And you might even have to go to court, all right? or go to the ethics committee. So this patient, you know, if he's continuing to do badly, we might have to go to the ethics committee. So there are situations that are not clear what the patient wants, which makes life very difficult, okay? So when you have a no code order or no CPR, none of the components of ACLS will be started, not even chest compression, all right? And then the prognosis is, why do we do that? Why do we make people no CPR? Two reasons. One is that's what the patient's goal is, or the family's goal is, or, and, or their prognosis is so bad 
that anything that we do is burdensome care and potentially harmful. Okay, remember, our job is to do no harm. When we know we're hurting the person with these interventions, we have a moral obligation to avoid that. All right? So, avoid any non-beneficial or painful or harmful intervention. Okay, however, this is another point of confusion. This is my second point of confusion here. The first point is that we're not going to do partial codes, chemical codes, shock codes, all right? The second part, which is very, very important, that anything that happens prior to my death, my cardiopulmonary arrest, is not included in an OCPR order, okay? Intubation, pressors, sepsis, blood transfusion, okay? That has to be addressed separately. Cardioversion, surgery, okay? So this is very clear, even in the position papers, and we have to separate out pre-arrest situations, bradycardia, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, prior to my death, all right? And that has to be addressed with the family. So patient may be, most of the patients that are intubated in the ICU are not from a cardiac arrest, right? 99% of the patients we take care of in the ICU didn't get there through via a cardiac arrest. How did they get there? Surgery? Okay, sepsis, pneumonia, ARDS, COPD, broken ribs, trauma, head injury, stroke, GI bleed. I can give you a thousand scenarios why patients end up intubated. Am I going to be able to predict each scenario in a family meeting? Hell no. So you have to have overriding goals that the family has or the patient might have. We had that conversation yesterday with a gentleman whose wife is here with a stroke. So goal of an OCPR is to allow the natural moment of death to occur without intervention. That's it. That's the only thing you're saying. The OCPR DNR means when you're dead, you can take the escalator to heaven and we will not go along with you. <laughs> okay? That's it. All right? Why? Because any intervention I do is going to hurt you. And that's based on data. All right? <coughs> so let's talk about survival rate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on television, and this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think, in about 10, 15 years ago. They reviewed, like, Chicago Hope and ER and all these fabulous medical shows that everybody's in love with, okay? They're generally looking at the doctors and the nurses and not at the story. But they found that it's 66%. The interesting thing about CPR on TV is that they do CPR. It lasts about 30 seconds because they have to break for a commercial break, okay, and make money. And then they come back after the commercial break, and the guy's in the lobby in the chair going home with a teddy bear, okay, next morning. Now, how realistic is that? Now, you have to understand that's what people watch. Okay, so they think that that's going to happen to them. Well, they saw it on TV, they, they went home next morning. That's not in reality what happens. So let's look at the actual statistics. The actual in-hospital survival rate for CPR, all comers, is about 15 to 18 percent. Pretty low. Okay, I'm talking about just being alive with a blood pressure and a heart rate. Then you have to ask yourself, how many of them are functionally able to go home versus a nursing home, right? That's a big deal for me. If you do CPR on me, I don't want to be gorked out in a nursing home. And guess what? 90% of Americans, when surveyed, say they don't want to be in a nursing home, gorked out, all right? Only 10% of Americans say, oh, if I'm in a coma, leave me in a coma. So it's very rare. I mean, we see a lot of these patients, but in reality, most people want to be home functioning, okay? so. And so there's a score for that, all right? So out of these 15 to 18 percent, guess what? At least 50 percent of them don't go home. 50, five, zero. At least 50 percent of these do not go home. They end up in a nursing home, all right? Then when you break it down into categories, if you're in septic shock, and this came out in critical care medicine last month, 300,000 patients they looked at in septic shock that got CPR, only 7 percent survived only 7% survived. So our lady with the pneumonia and the stroke in septic shock on vasopressor, her survival rate with CPR is going to be less than 7%. But I'm going to give you more data which will take that number down even more, like Hope says, okay? Frail elderly, survival rate is less than 5%, okay? Any advanced chronic illness, 
cardiac disease, COPD, cancer, cirrhosis, dialysis patient, dementia, stroke, you're looking at survival rates of probably less than 1%. All right. So this is a study that came out, again, from the CPR registry. Thousands and thousands of patients. The overall, and this is recent data. This is even with cooling. Okay, so somebody might say, well, doctor, maybe you're full of it. Okay, since we're cooling people, everybody goes home, their brains are just fine. No, this is after cooling. Remember, cooling started in 2001, all right, 15 years ago. This is reported in 2009, 2013. The overall survival rate has not gone down very much. I mean, it's not gone up very much. It's still 15 to 18 percent. Certain patients do worse. Black patients do worse. Other races do worse. So white, white patients do better than other. And, and people argue about that. But look at this. Neurological survival with minimal deficit upon discharge. If you're over the age of, age of 85, your neurological survival is about 4%. I think this is important for me to share this. You know why? Because when families talk to you and they say, well, doctor, you know, what exactly is going to happen to my mom at the age of 70 with pneumonia and septic shock if you do CPR? We have to have those numbers. If we don't have those numbers, you're umming and eyeing, and, you know, you lose credibility. Correct? And so every nurse, every doctor needs to know these scores. So what is the GOFAR score? The GOFAR score stands for Good Outcome for Attempted Resuscitation. This has now become a universal score for every intensive care unit to have prior to the discussions. It includes 13 parameters, and you can go to a website called gofarcalc.com. So if I admit a patient to the ICU, like Hope, oh, when you go around in the ICU, if somebody were, let's say you had a student or somebody who wants to do research, and say, okay, go through our ICU, here's a laptop, here's the internet, go to gofarcalc.com, and they will tell you exactly which category each of our patients in the ICU will fall into, based on these 13 parameters. So let's go through these parameters. Neurological deficit on admission, patient with a stroke, is the highest mortality. That's the worst prognosticator. If you come into the hospital with a neurological deficit, you are not going to make it with CPR. All right, major trauma, major stroke, metastatic cancer, sepsis, okay, medical non-cardiac diagnosis. Why do they say non-cardiac diagnosis? Well, MIs do pretty well, right? If I come in with an MI, even if I'm 80 years old, if I have VTAC, you're going to shock me and I might walk out. So a cardiac diagnosis should encourage you to tell the family, don't make them a no CPR. That's what this is telling you. If I come in with an MI, I should be resuscitated because I could just respond to one shock. So that gets rid of this, oh, shockable rhythm, non-shockable rhythm. Look at the diagnosis first before you start that argument, right? I would not recommend a person admitted with an acute MI or a coronary syndrome that they be no code. Unless they say, doctor, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm 90 years old. If God takes me, I don't want electricity. I don't want anything. Leave me alone. But I would not recommend that be, they be no CPR. Medical non-cardiac liver failure, end-stage liver failure, admission from a sniff, hypotension or shock, renal failure, on a ventilator, pneumonia, age, over 85. So this was a landmark study by Ebo. Okay, look at this, in 2013. This is now three-year-old data, okay, and this is called the GOFAR score, and you can Google this, okay, and you can find this score, all right? So, and this was also published, it was published basically, the Ebo study was published in cardiac journals, resuscitation journals, critical care journals, internal medicine journals. Yes, it's escaped most physicians. They made, they, they made a very good attempt to disseminate this information to physicians. Okay, so let's look at a patient that comes in. This is a very simple chart from critical care medicine. If you're neurologically intact, which our patient is not, and they come in with sepsis, Sepsis, yes, no. If they don't have sepsis, their survival from CPR is pretty good, one in five. But if they're on sepsis and they're on a mechanical ventilation, okay, then their survival is about 15%. If they're on mechanical ventilation and they have renal failure, okay, the chances of survival to a neurological function is about 3%. It's mind-blowing. 
-hmm. This is mind blowing. It opens up your eyes. We have a lot of these patients. We, this is what we do every day. Mm -hmm. And how do we walk around the ICU not knowing these statistics? We're hurting people. We're adding to our bill. We're wasting resources. We're going to run out of money. Okay, and we're causing harm, we're causing pain. And it's our moral obligation to inform patients of this. Okay, this came out last month in critical care medicine from China. 300,000 patients almost. Okay, just looking at septic shock. And what they did is they only looked at outcomes of septic shock of patients they did CPR on. All right, and not even looking at neurological outcome. This is just survivability outcome. If you're in septic shock and you're in the ICU and we do CPR on the only 7% will survive to discharge. And again, at least 50% of these will end up in a nursing home with bad neurological status. So after meeting with this family, all right, and discussing and getting the GOFAR score, the GOFAR score on this patient who came in from a nursing home with a stroke, with COPD, in septic shock is 0.9%. 0.9%, so I hope is correct. That was the right number. You were correct. One, I'm, I'm shocked that you said that. I'm really shocked because even I, before go far score, would have said about 5%, 10%. Dismal, dismal, 0.9%, folks, of, of being, going home with a good neurological score. Okay, so who should we make no CPR? We should make CPR. Again, you have to get consent from the family based on their advanced directive or their surrogate decision maker. Patients whose outcome after CPR would be extremely poor. They're going to have poor survivability or poor neurological function. Baseline elderly, anybody over the age of 85 certainly should not get CPR. Okay, somebody has chronic irreversible illness, COPD, dementia, recent stroke, cancers. Acute illness, septic shock, okay, and intracerebral bleed. So the two things that really portend a very, very bad outcome with CPR, obviously, is a stroke. Whether it's a bleed or an ischemic stroke, you should not resuscitate those people, right? They're clearly candidates for no CPR. And that would be my first conversation with every major stroke, right? Yes, you give TPA, but if they don't respond after three, four days, before they go home, let's get a pulse on these people. Let's get a pulse on people with these things. Dementia, COPD, cancer. Okay, cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction is 10%. I still see them coming in as a full code. All right, they're found in stool, covered with stool, aspirated. We resuscitate them for three weeks, all right? Any acute uh, deterioration. Usually it's like a subarachnoid bleed or a massive stroke, all right? That is really bad. Patient's wishes. Not many patients have advanced directives. Do you know what percentage of Americans today have advanced directives? About 20 years ago, it was about 10%. Now it's about 30%. Okay, I don't know what you find here in this neighborhood. In Lodi, I used to find, at Lodi, I find about 10% have advanced directives. However, when I was at Kaiser, who does a very, very good job, about 30 to 40% of the patients have advanced directives. So as, as a community, we need to step it up, okay? So that is my guide, you know, that helps me. Okay, now here's the thing. We should not <coughs> focus on the intervention. This is where, this is my third point I would like to make. Let's not get tripped up by the actual intervention. Our focus should be on the outcome and the goals that the patient wishes. The only way nurses and doctors can make common sense out of this is to approach it that way. Don't get bogged down. Oh, what if it's in defibrillation? What if it's in VTAC? Shall we defibrillate him? Shall we give him atropine? Shall we give epic? If my outcome, regardless, is going to be 0.9, whether you shock me or give me epi or intubate me, it doesn't really matter, right? And how can a family make that decision? If you put to the family, oh, we can give epi, they don't know what epi is. Or we could give vasopressin, or we could give amiodarone, or, you know, if his heart becomes irregular, we'll give him lidocaine. Stop using jargon. They don't know what these things mean. You're the professional. You went to school for 30 years. You know what these things mean. They don't. Okay? It doesn't mean that they're not educated. They could be very well educated. My brother's a Harvard MBA. He doesn't know jack shit. <laughs> okay? He doesn't know any of this. All right, so focus 
on the outcome. Focus on the outcome. All right. Don't focus on the intervention. Okay. Please remember that. Do not focus. And this is universal. This is the teaching everywhere. It's not just Habib saying this. When I read all these articles about addressing end of life, they all caution you. Every one of them. And I've given all those articles to Patty for you to review. So we're talking about shared decision making. Keep it simple. Base it on two things, patient wishes and your scientific knowledge. That's it. That's the bottom line. You're the scientist. You make the decision. You make the recommendation. Then ultimately, the patient autonomy can kick in. They can trump you and say, look, regardless of what you're saying, Dr. Habib, I want you to call my mom. Okay? Then you have a difference of opinion, but you cannot browbeat the family. You say, okay, thank you. All right? So remember, overall, in the ICU, we have high mortality situation. Nationally, only 10 to 15% uh, to of patients die in the ICU. Very high mortality rate. We often are dealing with patients who are in pain, they're in discomfort, they have tubes, we're doing interventions that are painful, burdensome, they're thrashing around. We have an obligation to give them pain medicine, give them fentanyl, give them morphine. The nurses actually are the ones that deal with the burdens. Okay, families are in angst, they're frustrated, they're crying. Do I see that? No, I don't. Okay, why? Because I'm in the room 12 minutes and the nurse is there for 12 hours. Right? So often the nurses will come to me and say, Dr. Habib, you please, can you address code status? Can you do something? The family is really upset. They don't understand what's going on. They don't know why these tubes. Mom is uncomfortable. Please sit down with them. So you are the patient advocate. And actually, the nurses are the ones that tend to favor comfort care more than physicians, right? In my 35 years of critical care medicine, I can say, without fear of contradiction, that the nurses are the ones that come to me and say, please stop this burdensome care. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. Right? Yeah. Okay. Physicians are the ones who are more refractory. In fact, in 1995, there was a study called the Support Trial, you know, where they looked in New York by Joanne Lynn, who's a very big name in ethics. And this actually made the newspapers. They found that the nurses went to the doctors frequently telling them that the family wanted a DNR. They wanted to stop. Okay, and 40% of the time the doctors refused. Okay, that was in the mid-90s. Okay, I don't think things have changed that much. I don't think things have changed that much. So I think the nurses have to keep this up. Okay, I think the nurses have to be patient advocate. You have to be looking at burdensome care because you create moral distress in the family and amongst the nurses. Okay, and if we shut out that nursing voice and don't listen to the nurses, then we're actually shutting out the family's voice. Correct? Yes. All right. So, when we take care of a patient, avoid automatic reflex action. Why are you doing this? Just because. I'm afraid the patient's going to die. I'm afraid I'm going to get sued, etc. Okay? We need to talk about that. Why are we doing this? What is the outcome going to be and how long are we going to continue this? Okay? And our focus should be to avoid harm. Look at the prognosis. Look at the benefits versus the burdens. What is the overwhelming goal here? Is our overwhelming goal just to keep going from day to day and sustain a pulse and a blood pressure on a ventilator or are we going somewhere? And on that journey that we're taking with the family, what's the pain and burden involved? It's a long journey. What's the pain and burden? We have a moral obligation to explain that and communicate that. The clarity of DNR orders, and this is not me, this is from critical care medicine. One problem with DNR orders involves interpreting, interpreting the order as a checklist of interventions to be applied or withheld rather than an all or none response to a critical event, example, a cardiac or respiratory arrest. The checklist approach, which can result in a partial DNR order, has its origin in the focus on the interventions rather than the goals of care. Does that make sense? This one simple slide tells it all. Right? Let's talk talking about pressors and blood. Shall we give blood? Shall we give pressors? Shall we do this? Let's look at where the journey. Are we going to Tahoe or are we going to San Diego? I want to go to San Diego, if you ask me. All right? 
Okay, avoid focusing on individual interventions. Let's look at the goals. Avoid confusion among the staff. Avoid harm. These are our overriding principles. Don't get confused. Don't harm the patient. Let's have clear, delineated goals because if we are not on the same page, guess what? The family's going to think we're a bunch of fools. Right? They're never going to trust us. All right. Partial codes. You're on thin ice. You're on thin ice. Okay. Partial codes mean individual components of ACLS are ordered. Chemical codes, defibrillation. Okay. There is no merit. There is no scientific data that it works. You cannot find. There's one study done in Israel on 37 patients. Guess what they found? No patient survived with a partial code. Zero survival. So why are we doing it? It's not scientific. All right. So that's the first thing I would like to eliminate. Let's get rid of that, okay? Slow codes are unethical, partial codes are not appropriate, and offer even less potential for survival. It is unethical. You are actually on worse med legal ground if you do a chemical code. If you do an electrical code, you know why? Because if that family misheard, got confused, okay, and find out and take you to court, and you found out that you open up the chart and an expert witness like me, they'll call, and then you're going to say, explain yourself, doc. Why didn't you do the whole bundle? Don't you know that ACLS points? is a bundle? That there's no benefit from a chemical code? or like, Why didn't you just do the whole thing then? So you decide, are you going to do the whole thing or not at all? If you decide that you want to try to revive the patient, then do the whole bundle because you're more likely to get sued. I, don't, I have never ever written in my entire critical care career, I'll tell you that, zero times a partial code. I've never done it. Never ever done it. Okay, if the family says, resuscitate my dad, I said, okay, we'll do it. But I'm going to do the whole thing. All right? Partial codes may recommend foregoing one or more of the following intubation, chest compression, electrical defibrillation, or ACLS medication. Okay, that's the definition of a partial code. They tell you don't do it. Don't do it. This is national literature, not St. Helena or Kaiser or Sutter. Okay, this is national recommendations. Partial attempts to reverse a cardiac or pulmonary heart arrest are medically unsound because these interventions are often highly traumatic and consistently inefficacious. Reference. Berger, 2003. This was in the Archives of Internal Medicine. Okay, frequently quoted article. All right. Such resuscitation commonly violates ethical obligations of non-malfeasance. That means don't hurt the patient. So they say allow a natural death. This is the position paper of the American Nursing Association. It's not just the doctors. We're all on the same page. Doctors and nurses are on the same page. DNR does not mean do not treat. <laughs> DNR does not address pre-cardiac arrest or pre-death medical interventions. Many possible treatments can still occur in the patients in the ICU with the DNR status. In fact, our sepsis bundle clearly states from CMS that DNR patients get admitted to the ICU. The only patients that do not get admitted to the ICU is comfort care. If, I admit, if I'm in septic shock and I'm a DNR, you have to complete the sepsis bundle on me. You have to intubate me, you have to put central lines in me, you have to put vasopressors, you have to do lactates, you have to do an echo, you have to do the whole nine yards. And CMS is looking at our charts. Okay, the only way you can forego these interventions pre-arrest is if I'm comfort care. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So that's where we need a palliative care team to help us figure all this out. And this requires a discussion with the family, have a team that is experts. We need a team of experts that can guide us through this landmine, all right? And always focus on what the family wants. Again, explain to the family what you're doing. I spend a lot of time with my families. My average family time is 45 minutes because I don't think you can do this in less than 30 minutes. Right? Yep. It's impossible. It's impossible. I've always spent a lot of time with my family. DNR does not mean do not treat, do not intubate, do not admit to ICU. What they found is that patients who made themselves no CPR 
actually did get uh, less care. Mm -hmm. And I've had families tell me that. I refuse to make myself or my dad no CPR because the last time I was in the hospital, they didn't even put him in the ICU mm -hmm. because they said he's a DNR. So that's our fault. That burden is upon us because we are confused as a community. No CPR does not mean you do not come to the ICU. All right? So let's all of us promote this, disseminate this in the interest of patient safety, in the interest of all being on the same page. Okay, every position paper that you read will tell you the biggest problem is when people interpret DNR as do not treat. We're doing an injustice. Okay, we're harming patient. Those have to be addressed separately. If I have a mucus plug and I'm a no CPR, you can suck out, intubate me, suck out a big goober, and extubate me and I'll go home tomorrow. Right? So you have to think scientifically. Patient in septic shock, 90% of the patients intubated in the ICU are not from cardiac arrest. They hopefully, 90% will get out. They will live. 90% of intubated patients in the ICU will get out. That's the statistic, unless they had a code, right? right. <laughs> so that's the, so, so that I could go through endless scenarios. It's not feasible for me to go over every scenario. That's the point of, of our discussion. So after 10 days on the ventilator, our lady, okay, is extubated. She continues with respiratory distress. She's on high flow nasal oxygen. She's confused, she's delirious, she's myopathic, she's on tube feeding, she's bed bound, okay? And then the patient has got transfer orders to the floor. The ICU nurses tell the doctor, well doc, if we send this patient to the floor, okay, there'll be a rapid response team called immediately because she's breathing at 30 times a minute. What are we gonna do? So here's what we do, we meet with the family. And now we meet with the family, and the family says, okay, you know, she's been on the ventilator 10 days, her stroke is still bad, she's still in respiratory failure, she's myopathic, she's delirious. What we will do is we will let her go to the floor, but she's not going to get intubated. So we're going to put a do not intubate. We're going to put in an order for do not transfer back to the ICU, do not escalate care. We're not going to bring her back for central line, for vasopressors. You see how confusing this can get, right? But it's a, each, we have to customize. My, my point here is that each patient's care plan has to be customized based on what they want, what the family wants, and what you see as a scientist, as a doctor. In this situation, if this were me or somebody in my family, I think that's very appropriate. You intubated her, you treated her pneumonia, she's going to aspirate again, she's going to end up in the nursing home. Why would I want to intubate her again? Why would I want to bring her back to the ICU? So what we need to develop in most hospitals is a do not escalate care, which we don't have here. Okay, our policies in this hospital have to be reviewed. Okay, why? Because we want to provide safe and efficacious care. Okay, and we have to protect our patients, as well as, you know, allow patients with autonomy to say, yeah, I want everything. We have patients every day. Okay, right now in the ICU we have several patients where the families insist that in spite of all this grim prognosis and terminal cancer or whatever, they still want whole nine yards. That's called patient autonomy. All right, we cannot fight that. So our ICU teams have many dilemmas every day. We get moral distress from this. The nurses get distressed. They get confused. If we don't talk about it in a, in a nice way, if we don't discuss this in a nice way, and ask each other questions. Doctor, what are your thoughts? Can you clarify this? What exactly is our, those are the kind of language I want to hear. Doctor, we're not really clear. Why are we doing this? The family doesn't want this. Can we clarify? Can we sit down, have the case managers come in, have sit down with the family? Sometimes things are so confusing that only sitting down with the family, then I come back out and say, okay, what well, clarify? Patient is still the full code, right? Stuff like that. It's not easy. There are many conflicts every day. We must understand the basic principles. If we don't play by the rules and don't understand this basic principle, we're truly messed up. And we'll never fight our way out of this mess. 
without having these guiding principles. We can talk about futile care and appropriateness of care next time, but we, this is the basic foundation that I presented to you. Let's have open discussions. Okay, let's not jump to conclusions, all right? Because there's a science that somebody has to review. Guess what, it's my job. As the IC director, it's my job to keep you abreast. How many of you have heard of the Go Far store? You had, right? Or Patty, just recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, and if you ask most of the doctors, if you ask even the intensivists, when I ask my intensivist colleague, have you read Eagle's paper on Go Far score? I've not found one who's read that paper. That's sad. I think that's sad that we as a critical mm -hmm. care community have not kept up with the literature. Right? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your time. I hope this helps. Hope we can provide better care for our <laughs>